Okay, let me move on. We're answering questions here. Glenn and John, the Q&A, patreon.com forward slash Glenn Show. Uh, accessible to everybody who supports us at Patreon, but getting to ask a question requires you to support us at the $10 tier. I had to say that, forgive me. Uh, this is from Isaac Woodward. Uh, for both John and Glenn, but I'm answering. Have you seen the documentary on Thomas Sowell? No, I have not seen it. Can you speak to his method of economic and political analysis and where you agree or disagree? Yes, I can most certainly do that. I admire all of your work so much and would love to see a roundtable discussion with all three of you. So would I, Isaac. You try getting through to Thomas Sowell, however. It ain't that easy, man. <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't want to travel. He wants to do his work. Who can I, blame I, him? The I, man I, just turned 90. I don't blame the man for not wanting to travel for crying out But you out know, loud. he he was that way when he was 60. He likes no, to sit I, down. He, he was that way. He was that his way. Work. I agree. Yeah. Uh, I know Sol is on the right of you on the political spectrum, but your commitment to rigorous analysis and facts over feel-good narratives distinguishes all three of you in the space of public intellectuals today. So thanks. Uh, thanks for that, um, Isaac. Yeah, I know Sol and I know his work. I think very highly of Thomas Sowell. He is a conservative. He's a fine economist. He's an old school literary historical economist in the sense that he doesn't write down equations and do fancy statistical techniques. He he's never not, did? Not so, not that I'm aware. I mean, I don't know every single word that he's written, but the books that mm -hmm. I am aware of, none fall in this category. Okay. But what he did do as he came along in the 1960s through graduate school and so forth, was put into practice a style of doing economics that had been uh, very much respected and very much alive throughout the 20th century, which is close attention to factual reports of every source, not necessarily those that are easily quantifiable and packaged as a statistical investigation, historical records, literary accounts, sociological reports, anthropological reports, and weave together this kind of, um, uh, synthesized is what the word that I'm looking for, this kind of uh, broadly gauged intellectual engagement with a question, okay, what kind of question? Why does racial inequality persist? How is it that we're thinking about racial inequality? How do we compare what happens in the US to other societies? What can we learn from looking at the implementation of affirmative action in West Africa, in South Asia, in East Asia, et cetera? Um, how do intellectuals approach their work? This is a kind of intellectual historian or uh, uh, even maybe an intellectual sociologist kind of approach. I mean, one of his books that I greatly admire is a conflict of visions in, in which he talks about, and I won't try to describe the book, but he talks about the role that intellectuals play in formulating the agenda of the discussion of public issues. Uh, so Sowell is an economist, perhaps in the spirit of someone like Friedrich von Hayek, uh, the great Friedrich von Hayek, a philosopher economist whose writings also seldom touched on uh, the modern day mathematically grounded methodologies or almost never did. Early in Hayek's career, Hayek, by the way, he's the author of uh, The Road to Serfdom, a popular book that had a great influence on American intellectual life in the 1940s. I'm sure that it had a profound influence on Milton Friedman. You pick up Capitalism and Freedom, Friedman's popular book, and you can see echoes of Hayek on almost every page. Um, but uh, this is Hayek, who exemplifies a kind of approach to economic writing, which is uh, uh, literary as opposed to uh, closely analytic. I'm not saying that it's not analytically structured and thoughtful. I'm just saying it doesn't try to quantify and write down models and formalize, or perhaps I should say doesn't take what is a very complex and nuanced reality and reduce it to a stick figure representation, which is what you have to do in order to fit it into a formal quantitative framework. He's willing to leave a lot of loose ends and ambiguities and mix it up. So you're, you're looking at the, a writing of the sort that you might expect from a historian or historical sociologist when you pick up a book by Thomas Sowell. Um, I have great respect for him. Yes, he's a conservative. 
I can tell you that when I came along in the 1970s as a graduate student, as an African-American, Thomas Sowell was uh, an apostate. He, he was a heretic. Uh, he, he was saying exactly the wrong thing. He was saying discrimination is not the issue. He was saying Blacks made more progress before the civil rights movement in terms of economic advance in the 1940s and the 1960s than they did after this. You look at the decades from 1970 and 1980 and so on. Thomas Sowell's perhaps a fundamental insight about racial inequality is that disparity does not prove discrimination. There's no reason to expect equality between groups or to take inequality between them ipso facto to be evidence of discrimination. There are a lot of culture matters. This is Thomas Sowell again. Migration and culture, that's another one of his books. Groups differ in ways that are relevant to the success of their members in various lines of uh, endeavor. You're not taking, this is me, not soul, but I think this is very much in the spirit of soul. You're not really taking groupness seriously if you think that we're supposed to have the same proportion of Jews, African-Americans, uh, Korean uh, American, Mexican American uh, in every department uh, in the university and in, in every professional a line of, of activity. There's supposed to be the same proportion of lawyers. There's supposed to be the same proportion of uh, physicists. There's supposed to be the same proportion of, uh, of uh, you know, anesthesiologists. And underrepresentation in anesthesiology is evidence of the failure of the profession to be open and fair and inclusive to people. This doesn't take groupness seriously because by very definition of a group, we mean an association of people who have cultivated among themselves and passed on to their children ways of looking at the world that are substantive. That sets of beliefs and ideals and practices and customs and expectations that are constitutive of the group. Jews are not Chinese for uh, the reasons that there is actual content to Jewishness and content to Chinese uh, ethnic cultural heritage. Uh, which then becomes reflected in their uh, practices and in the outcomes that uh, they uh, realize in society. Uh, there are many other soulisms that one could go into, but I just want to say these are very important uh, observations. Thomas Sowell's, in my mind, uh, most profound book is called Knowledge and Decisions. It's not about race at all. It's about, in a very Hayekian spirit, power and control in society and the role of know-it-all intellectuals and experts vis-a-vis -vis the role of common and ordinary people and the way in which politics can lead government to impose a kind of expert judgment over the wisdom and knowledge that people have in effect embedded in their practice and in their social situation, which may not be easily extracted by the kind of expertise, but which if experts are empowered by government can nevertheless be the, the thing that drives a, a social policy, knowledge and decisions. Hayek's point, which Sol echoes, is that markets allow for the kind of knowledge relevant to good and efficient decision-making to be carried out by people who act in their own self-interest and that centralized imposition of government diktat is more likely to reflect the quote unquote knowledge of ideologically uh, committed expert classes over the knowledge of the people who have to decide whether a business can actually flourish on this corner, uh, et cetera. The, the um, relationship between knowledge and decisions is a central theme of, of, of social philosophy and so pursues it there. So will probably never be awarded the Nobel Prize in Economic Science because he's 90 years old and well, uh, because they don't give Nobels for the kind of economics that he does. Generally speaking, I can't think of the last person who didn't write equations down in their work who uh, was so honored. Um, there have been some, but uh, it is, uh, it's not the common fare. Uh, but he should be considered, in my uh, informed opinion, because the, the seriousness of his work, the sustained productivity that he's exhibited, um, and, and the uh, insight that, that he has generated 
rival in my mind that of of many who have been who have been so honored. Another reason that Seoul may not probably won't be honored in this way is because he's political. In, in addition to his uh, scientific work as an economist or a social historian, however you want to label him, he also writes a column and he also opines on, on various issues. And the man is to the right of center. There's not any doubt about that. And unfortunately, nowadays, if you're a committee giving prizes and you give it to somebody to the right of center, you have a lot to answer for when you do that. And people may therefore be a little bit reluctant for both the reasons of method that I have called attention to. He's not on the cutting edge frontier of the scientific uh, aspect of economic inquiry, but also for the reasons of politics. It's so unfair. It's funny when you when you talk about him, there's a there's a plangent note in my mind because the scope of his achievement really deserves more than the general thinking public has given him. You know, he was kind of a household name among reading people 25 and 30 years ago as that rare bird, the black conservative. You, you'll remember a time when he was often the first person, the person who worked in the office next to you would bring up. But that was about as far as it went outside of conservative circles. And I, it's, it's really, it's not fair. And it's, there's a thing about Sowell that often, that isn't often mentioned, which is that, talk about rare bird, he is a black academic who quite often has written on non-racial subjects, you know, just an economics textbook, two, two volumes. He can step completely outside of the race thing and just express himself about just stuff, which is not, not the usual. And I find it interesting that with Sowell, one reason some people today would find it hard to go with him is that he doesn't write with that tribalist sense. He's trying to be purely objective and there's nothing in him of, here's what we down here think. Here's what we've been through. It's not seasoned with any of that. He's just trying to have a white lab coat on and look at the facts. And for, I think most readers, especially these days, wherever you are on the spectrum, except for hard right, for him to not write with that fragrance of identity makes him somehow sterile. I think it comes from the same place that he can sit and write about something that has nothing to do with being black. He's capable of stepping outside. And that's a weird quality in many ways, but I think a lot of what frustrates you and me is that there are many people who are too inside that they, if the facts speak against that fragrance that I'm talking about, then it's the fragrance that you have to go with. We in here and our feelings. Sowell predates that and he's spiritually antithetical to that. And it makes him inaccessible, I think, to a lot of people who otherwise would find him quite brilliant. He does truly awesome work. And then the only other problem with Sowell is that he came along a little too early. You know, there's not a whole lot of media about him, you know, when he's in his prime, it's about network television. And yeah, there's no such thing as the internet. And because he is a grind who wants to just write his books, he wasn't that crazy about making himself a brand outside of the newspaper column. But you know, today, what's a newspaper? And so, <laughs> you know, he, he can't, he wasn't, he didn't have a Glenn show, because technologically, that was impossible. But, but yeah, I always get a little sad when Sowell comes up. 